Greetings, aliens and earthlings. This is the third and final part of our mini-series about the shape of the universe. In the first two episodes, we learned about finite models for a universe without an edge, and about curvature. If you haven't watched them, or haven't watched them in a while, I suggest you watch them first. Today we will examine the available evidence for the actual shape of the universe. <laughs> People usually imagine the universe as infinite. In parts 1 and 2, I tried to convince you that it could just as well be finite. Now, when you think of the expansion of the universe, you will probably think of an inflating balloon and imagine the universe as finite, but I will try to convince you that it could just as well be infinite. In the previous No Edge episode, we learned that the universe could be positively curved, flat or negatively curved. The basic, simply connected examples of the shapes would be the hypersphere, the Euclidean space and the hyperbolic space, the three-dimensional equivalent of an infinite saddle surface. The hypersphere is finite, as are all other models with positive curvature, for example, the projective space and the Poincaré dodecahedral space. There are no infinite positively curved models, because any multiple connected model is some kind of hyperburrito made of a simply connected version of the same curvature. You can't wrap a finite hypersphere to get an infinite burrito. Euclidean space is infinite. But there are also finite models with zero curvature, like the hypertorus, the quarter turn manifold, and so on. So you can wrap an infinite space into a finite hyperburrito. The same holds for negative curvature. The hyperbolic space is infinite, but some other models are finite, like the Seyfert Weber space or the Picard horn. But before we can discuss which models are the most likely, we need to discuss something else the Big Bang. Many people imagine the Big Bang like this in the beginning, there was a big void, and darkness was upon the void. Suddenly, a bunch of something appeared in the center of the void, and expanded rapidly into the surrounding void, creating atoms and stars and galaxies and stuff. This is utter nonsense. There was no surrounding void. The universe didn't expand into something, it just expanded. To understand this, think back to our first lesson and imagine that the universe is a flat space which repeats itself in each direction, like in some video games, a flat hypertorus. There is no outside, the video game space is all there is. Now, we can imagine that your video game space gets bigger as time passes. The world expands, and the things inside drift apart. It doesn't expand into anything, and there is no expansion center, it just gets more and more spacious, and distances between objects get bigger and bigger. It is more useful to display this in the usual way, as a finite blob inside an embedding space. But this is just a way of visualizing it, as far as we know, there is no embedding space, and what's inside the universe is all that is. Now, when we rewind time, the universe gets smaller and smaller. It's the same principle as a Castorian garbage press. To dispose of garbage, Castorians create a bubble in spacetime with warp technology, dump the garbage inside, separate the bubble from the universe except for a narrow connection and make it shrink until the garbage has transformed into a big blob of hot plasma. This way, they circumvent galactic regulations about dumping garbage into black holes or parallel universes. The universe, played backwards, is like a giant Castorian garbage dump. Earthling astrophysicists have precisely calculated a timeline of the universe. For a moment, let's assume that the universe actually has finite volume. When we go back in time, its volume gets smaller. When we rewind about 13.7 billion solar cycles, matter becomes compressed in some kind of hot plasma soup of free electrons and protons. When we go further back, our cosmic garbage dump gets even smaller and denser until it becomes almost a point, and astrophysicists' heads start to explode. Those who are familiar with quantum physics keep it up longer, but eventually, it gets so dense that nobody can tell what's going on. We could imagine that one trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second earlier, it was actually a point, a singularity, the famous Big Bang. But we can't compute up to this point. So, mathematically, this singularity isn't a point, it's an enormous division by zero error. Or rather a division by infinity error. When we play the film forward, the universe starts with this division by infinity error. If you think causally, as earthlings do, you might imagine that this error caused the creation of the universe. 
Some Earthlings might conclude that the universe is actually a glitch, caused by a supernatural entity being careless with mathematics. But that's philosophy, not cosmology. In the last episodes we have learned that the universe could be finite, but it could just as well be infinite. What happens if we rewind an infinite universe up to the Big Bang? Well, like the finite brother, it becomes denser and denser, but it stays infinite. So, if the universe is infinite, is the Big Bang a point, or an infinite space? The answer is, neither. The Big Bang is a singularity, a cosmic division by infinity error. In this case, you'd have infinity by infinity, which is even more undefined. How do we know that the universe expands, anyway? We know it because of Hubble's law, the farther away objects in space are, the faster they move away. We can't see them moving, but we can see the redshift due to their movement. It's a bit like the red tail lights of a spaceship moving away from you. Now, the odd thing is that far away objects move a bit slower away than they should, according to Hubble's law. Does this mean that the universe expands faster here than elsewhere? Not exactly. A look into deep space is always a look into the past as well. So, if objects in the past move slower than they should at the current expansion rate, it means that the universe expands faster now than in the past. In other words, the expansion of the universe is accelerating. It's not quite clear what's the cause of this acceleration. It appears to be some kind of energy, but a strange kind of energy which doesn't redshift or dilute when the universe expands. Earthlings call it dark energy. In the context of cosmology, dark means we can't see it, but we know it's out there. By the way, dark energy must not be confounded with dark matter, a mysterious, invisible matter that reveals its presence only by its gravity. Dark matter is called dark because earthlings can't see it and are not sure what it is. There are several hypotheses, but none of them has been validated by observation so far. Observing that which is invisible can be quite challenging. So, the history of the universe in a nutshell, after a short and violent initial inflation, the universe expanded at a slower rate. But while it cooled down and stars and galaxies formed, the expansion accelerated continuously due to dark energy. This acceleration continued till the present day and will most likely continue in the foreseeable future. Now, according to a formula called Friedman equation, the curvature of the universe is determined by the density of matter, ordinary matter, dark matter, radiation and dark energy combined. The critical value is around that of 5 hydrogen atoms per cube meter. With this density, the universe is flat. If it is denser, it is positively curved. If it is less dense, it is negatively curved. Which brings us back to the main question of this video, what is the shape of the universe? Determining the shape of the universe would be much easier if we had some kind of snapshot of the young universe. Fortunately, we do have such a snapshot, the Cosmic Microwave Background, or CMB. To understand this, let's watch the movie about the expanding universe again. We see that shortly after the Big Bang, the matter forms some kind of hot plasma soup. Plasma is one of the four states of matter. It's not a transparent broth but an opaque potage, not so much because of its density, give or take 20 protons and 20 electrons of ordinary matter per cube millimeter, but because of those free roaming electrons which are literally all over the place like Antarian bats on drugs. It's glowing orange like heated metal, and it's full of photons, but those photons can't get very far without bumping into wild electrons. Now, this changes 370 millennia after the Big Bang, at this point, our hot soup is sufficiently cooled down that protons and electrons can combine into atoms and form a gas. It's simply a phase transition, like freezing or vaporization. The phase transition between plasma and gas is called recombination. With the wild roaming electrons gone, the opaque plasma potage becomes transparent, and photons can travel freely over long distances. Suddenly, it's as if someone had lifted the curtains from the world stage, the whole universe gets flooded with radiation from every point in every direction. We could call this the grand opening of the cosmos. Where did all this light from the grand opening go? Well, most of it is still crossing the universe. The expansion of the universe has stretched the waves to microwave length, but it's still visible in the background, coming from everywhere. You can even create a map of it. That's the microwave background radiation. Is this a snapshot of the surface of the plasma soup? Well, kinda, but not exactly. The soup filled the whole three-dimensional universe, but the map is two-dimensional. So, what does this map show? Well, all the things you see in the night sky form a bubble, the observable universe. But the further you go out, the further you go back in time. So it's rather like a series of onion peels reaching back in time. 
The outermost peel is on the surface of the primordial plasma soup. We can't see any further. The part where our cone touches the surface of the soup is a bubble in space, called the last scattering surface. So, the map doesn't show all of the grand opening of the cosmos, but a bubble-shaped cutout, a spherical drill core from deep down in time. Why is this last scattering surface important? Well, imagine the universe is finite, say, for example, a torus universe, a box with opposing sides portaled together. Now consider our bubble, the last scattering surface. Because we have a hypertorus, we find the same bubble behind each portal. But what if the bubble doesn't quite fit into the box? Well, in this case, it crosses the portals on all six sides, which means that it intersects itself. We should have circular intersections on each pair of portals. This means that if the observable universe doesn't quite fit into the box, we could find pairs of identical circles on the radiation map. Those are called circles in the sky. Finding those circles would indicate what shape the universe has. Six pairs of circles, for example, could indicate a Poincaré dodecahedral space, if corresponding circles are twisted in the right way. So, we have found the first possible approach to determining the shape of the universe, but we don't have many conclusive results yet. Earthling scientists are currently looking for those circles, but it's a computational challenge for their primitive computers. It seems that recent studies have ruled out a hypertorus and a Poincaré dodecahedral space with overlapping circles, but those results are still being discussed. But even if they were confirmed, that wouldn't generally rule out those shapes, it would only mean that if the universe is a hypertorus or a Poincaré space, the observable bubble probably fits inside. But what if the bubble is so big that the box fits inside several times? In this case, the same galaxies, quasars etc., could be seen at different spots, forming a repeating pattern. It wouldn't necessarily be obvious, because the different images would have different ages, the nearer, the older. It would be like a floor ornament found on an archaeological site, with a repeating pattern, but at different stages of fading colors and decay. So, how to detect such a pattern? Of corresponding points in these patterns would have the same distance. So, when we count the frequency of all distances between pairs of stars in this pattern, we should observe that some distances occur way more often than the rest. This approach is called cosmic crystallography because we see the same phenomenon in a crystal. Earthlings have attempted this approach, for example for faraway quasars. However, the available catalogues of faraway objects are not yet complete enough to obtain usable results. But it would already be great to know what's the curvature of the universe. We could try to measure very large triangles. Imagine a triangle between our galaxy and two points on the surface of the primordial soup. If we knew the side lengths of the triangle, we could compute what the angle on our corner should be, according to Euclidean school geometry. Then we could compare this with the measured angle. If the measured angle is equal to the Euclidean angle, we have a flat space. If it's smaller, it's negatively curved. If it's bigger, it's positively curved. Sounds easy, right? The problem is, of course, that we don't know the exact side lengths of the triangle. Well, we know two of them, the long sides correspond to the distance of the last scattering surface. But the third one is tricky, nobody thought of printing a scale onto the cosmic microwave background. Even an imperial unit scale would help. Well, we might not have a precise scale, but we have something else, fluctuations of density which manifest as hot spots on the cosmic microwave background. Those are like bubbles on the surface of the cosmic soup, and we can predict their radius, because they have grown with the speed of sound. Now we have the third side of the triangle, and we can compare the angular size of those bubbles on the SIMB with the size they should have in a flat universe. If they appear larger, then the triangle's angles are pumped up and we have positive curvature. If they appear smaller, we have negative curvature. We can also see this in another way. In episode 2, we saw that on a positively curved surface, the border of a round patch is shorter, and on a negatively curved surface, it is longer. Similarly, the surface of a ball is smaller than one might think in a positively curved space and bigger in a negatively curved space. When we apply this to our last scattering surface, it will be smaller in a positively curved space. The hot spots on the same image, the next best thing to a scale on the map, will appear larger. In a negatively curved space, the surface will be bigger, and the hot spots will appear smaller. That's just another way to come to the same conclusion. The results show that the hot spots have roughly the expected size, so the universe seems to be more or less flat. Unfortunately, we can't tell more, it could just as well be just a little bit curved, positively or negatively. I left my favorite approach for the end, the cosmic drum. 
See, before the recombination, the universe was opaque but noisy, literally filled with sound waves. In other words, it rang like a drum. We can see a snapshot of those sound waves on the cosmic microwave background. Now, everybody knows that the size of a drum influences its sound, a large drum has a deep pitch. A smaller drum has a higher pitch. Why? Simply because there is no place for a long deep sound wave on a small drum. Also, the shape of the drum influences how it sounds. But what sound did the universe make? We can analyze the fluctuations on the same B, and decompose them into different wavelengths. Now, if the universe is infinite, or very very large, we should see strong long wavelengths on the same B. But we don't. Long waves are remarkably weak on the same B image, as if the cosmic drum was not big enough for long wavelengths. The observed data seems to fit rather well with finite models like the Poincaré dodecahedral space and the flat hypertorus, better than with infinite models. It also seems to fit better with well-proportioned models, rather than ones with different sizes in different directions. This is far from being definitive proof, but it could be a hint that the universe might indeed be finite. In conclusion, nobody on this planet knows what shape the universe has, not even whether it's flat, or a little bit curved. But Earthling scientists are working hard on the problem. And, who knows, maybe their shiny new James Webb Space Telescope will bring the answer, after all, it has been built to look far into the depths of space and time. And truth, as they say, is probably somewhere out there. Before I tell you about alien cosmology, a word from our sponsor, Smooth Space. You've colonized some systems and built up your own little star empire. Naturally, this creates a lot of paperwork, and you run out of storage space. So you do what everybody does. You dump the old paperwork in a parallel universe layer, and forget about it. Out of sight, out of mind, right? But after some millennia, all those yotta tons of documents buried in a parallel manifold start messing with your system's gravity. In other words, you have a dark matter problem. But don't worry. We at Smooth Space have the technology to haul your dark waste out of your systems into natural dark matter clouds. Just give us a call, and we even out your space time within a decade. Smooth Space, your dark matter disposal service. What I presented here is the Earthling approach to cosmology, dictated by Earthling concepts like causality, binary logic and the cosmological principle. I don't know much about advances in alien cosmology, it's all classified. But what I can tell you is that different alien races have different approaches to cosmology. Alderbaranians, for example, don't experience time as distinct from space as earthlings do. For Alderbaranian cosmologists, the universe is simply some oddly shaped hyperpretzel with singularities in the time flow, big bangs, big crunches, pit splits, big fusions and so on. That's what happens when you drop the cosmological principle. Centauri, on the other hand, consider the universe some kind of ring Bologna, a finite universe following a closed time loop, secured by a big bounce which prevents any attempt to cause time paradoxes, from messages with future lottery numbers to grandfather killing parcel bombs. And then there are the Sargassians, who believe the universe is the skin of an adolescent hyperkraken. What earthlings call dark energy is for them the rapidly growing skin of the kraken, which explains why it doesn't get less dense when the universe expands. Sargassians are decent scientists, but they have replaced Occam's razor with the rule of cool, in other words, they prefer entertaining hypotheses to simple ones. I thank Professor Jean-Pierre Luminet for reading my manuscript and suggesting a modification in the part about dark energy and dark matter. To be honest, I was surprised he didn't find more nonsense, as I'm not an astrophysicist. If you find any mistake, please tell me in the comments below. Anyway, this was the third and last episode about the shape of the universe. Unless, of course, somebody finds out what the actual shape of the universe is, in which case I may make a part 4. So, if I were you, I would subscribe to this channel, just in case. So long, like this video, tell all your friends, students and teachers, and don't forget to be alien.